Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the presentation of the Black Brain Center of America, whether you are joining us in person or virtually. My name is Wesley Blackburn, and I'm the Community Engagement Librarian for the Long Branch Free Public Library. We just want to ask everyone first to please silence your cell phones and keep your mask on unless eating or drinking. We have some water bottles and hard candies over on the table over here, so feel free to help yourself. We also have a unisex bathroom down this way, um, which is right across from our movie theater. Um, if you haven't been to the movie theater before, feel free to take a look after the program. Uh, we will be showing movies all month long, and you can book the movie theater um, through me. Uh, we have many in-person and virtual programs uh, coming up in the month of March. So please sign up for our monthly newsletter on our Facebook and on our website. Uh, this is where you also find our March uh, children's and adult calendars. So at this point, I would like to introduce educator and park ranger Tracy Hall, who will be presenting this program, the Black Brain Center of America. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'd like to begin this afternoon by just sharing a little bit of my story with you um, on my journey to becoming a park ranger. Um, I am a teacher. In fact, I started, originally started teaching in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, I left Atlanta, Georgia and moved to New Jersey and um, got a job as an educator. Um, I taught uh, middle school for about 15 years, and those of you that, <laughs> that know anything about teaching, uh, middle school can be some of the most difficult ages to teach. Um, I did that for 15 years, and after that I was taken out of the classroom, and I became a master teacher for my district, and that entailed me basically trying to help new teachers and teachers that were having issues or struggling, helping them learn how to be a better educator. Um, from that, um, they took me out of that position, budget cuts of course, and threw me in a third grade classroom, which was eye-opening for me. I had always taught middle school, so to go with the young, the young kids was very, very different. Um, I did that for a couple years, and I was able to finish my ten tenure as a teacher uh, in the fifth grade, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, teaching was some of the best experiences of my life. Um, I often encourage people because I hear a lot of people nowadays disparaging teachers, and I have to say um, that 25 years of teaching was incredible for me and also the opportunities it provided for me um, because I was a teacher and educator for 25 years I had so many opportunities I was um, chosen to take an expedition to uh, the Amazon rainforest for two weeks um, and simply because I was a teacher and we actually went and followed some scientists that were doing some really important work in the Amazon. Um, I also went on an archaeological dig to Mexico um, because of, as educators. So the reason I tell you these things are because so often we hear people talk about being a teacher and how it's boring or whatever, but teaching is just like any other profession is what you make of it. Um, from teaching, I um, actually took um, a group of students out west to, um, we went to Yellowstone, Grand Teton Park, and from that experience, I was always interested in the Park Service, and I always thought that that was like that dream job, but you know, you never think you could have that dream job. And um, while I was out west, uh, as a teacher, taking some students around, I met some park rangers, and lo and behold, and talking to them, one said to me, well, this is just my summer job, and I'm a teacher. And the antenna went up. 
And um, I talked to this young lady, and she explained to me how the Park Service has a program entitled Teacher, Ranger, Teacher, in which they, they love teachers. They want teachers to join the Park Service. And I applied for that particular program. And of course, my naivete, I, uh, <laughs> I immediately said, I want to go to Yellowstone National Park, or I want to go to Grand Teton National Park. And um, I sent my application to Teton. The, one of the rangers at Teton was kind enough to call me. He's like, I love your application. Uh, he was basically humoring me. He's like, um, you do know there's a national park in New Jersey. And immediately, you know, I got a little sad. I said, no. <laughs> and um, he said, well, yes, what I'd like to do is I'd like to send your application to the park in New Jersey. Uh, I think, you know, that you would make, be a great fit for that. And I was, I, I'll be honest with you, I was very disappointed. But I thought, okay. And I'm thinking in my mind, a park in New Jersey? Yeah, right. And um, actually, uh, one of the rangers got in touch with me, and we talked, and I decided to, um, <laughs> to um, he said, well, how about you come down and give us a visit, and, you know, you can decide how you feel about it. And I have to tell you that when I drove up 36 and I hit that bridge to come across, it was one of the biggest eye moments of my life because I was just like, I had no idea that such a beautiful place existed, such a pristine and beautiful place existed in New Jersey. And um, I have to say from that day forward, I was hooked. I, was, I fell in love with Sandy Hook and that was in 2011. And I worked as a teacher ranger teacher for two summers. Um, and after that, the Park Service hired me as a seasonal. And I worked um, all the way up until this past season, um, which was 10 years. And I have to tell you, it was wonderful, a wonderful experience. Um, I learned so much working for the Park Service. And I just really appreciated it. It gave me appreciation appreciation for the local history that's here a lot of it that I knew very little about when I first started um, one of the things initially that um, I've always been really interested in history um, I taught history I taught history and science and I began to just learn about Sandy Hook um, when I first started working there and Sandy Hook has an incredible history that's right here in town that so many people here aren't aware of. And um, the first couple of years that I worked there, I spent, you know, just learning about uh, Fort Hancock and uh, the fauna and the flora there at the park. And I ended up running across some information, I believe, like the third summer that I worked there. And I, it, it kind of just, took me on a path um, to learn more and more and to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And those of you that live in this area, um, in Mammoth County, Mammoth County, as a matter of fact, um, there's some incredible history right here and some incredible, incredible African-American history here that is very little known here. And one of the things, and I'll just touch on this because um, this was one of the very first research that I really dove deep into, and it was about um, Colonel or Cornelius Titus, who actually is right here from this area, from Colts Neck. And um, a lot of you that live in this area are probably familiar with um, some of the other history, the revolutionary history that took place here. But um, the story of Cornelius Titus, or Colonel Ty, as he was called, is something that we don't really know a lot about it hasn't really been well known well he was a slave he was an enslaved person in Colts Neck actually and he was a slave on a Quaker's um, land and at that time this was back in the 1700s long story short Cornelius Titus uh, uh, there was a proclamation that was given that said any enslaved person that would escape and join the British would gain their freedom. This young man at the age of 21 years old 
escape from here in New Jersey, having never been out of the state of New Jersey in his life, and um, ran away, made it all the way to Virginia. He joined up with the British in Virginia and fought a couple battles there. And then for maybe a year or so, the record we don't hear Cornelius Titus. And then suddenly, at the Battle of Monmouth, he appears again. And not just does he appear, but he actually does some pretty incredible things. And he ends up capturing single-handedly a British command, uh, I'm sorry, uh, American commander. And from that point on, the British end up, of course, back then, an enslaved person or a black person could not really hold a title in the army, but they were so impressed with him and his abilities. Now remember, he grew up in this area, so he knew every creek, every river, but he knew his way around this area. So the British ended up um, giving him a title, they called him Colonel Ty. Uh, and he went on to become the greatest guerrilla fighter that the British had. And he was right here in Monmouth County. In fact, if you go back and you look during that time period, you'll find all kinds of newspaper articles written about him, about how he was a scourge of Monmouth County and they wanted to get rid of him. And um, that history, the incredible thing that I found out is that Colonel Ty and his brigade were stationed right at Sandy Hook, right at the lighthouse at Sandy Hook. And that's a history that really hasn't been told. Unfortunately, because he fought on the side of the British, uh, his history hasn't really been told. Um, in fact, um, very few people really know his story. And one of the first things that I, one of the first research that I did for the Park Service was to find as much as I could about Colonel Ty and that whole story. And my hope is that um, as the Park Service will take the information about Colonel Ty and perhaps, you know, well, one thing is it, has, it is on our website now and you can learn more about him. And I, one thing I would like for you guys to do, if you'd like to know a little bit about local African American history, Cornelius Titus. Read about him. It's an incredible story. Well, after I did the um, research on uh, Colonel Titus, for years and years, when I first started working for the Park Service, I had always heard people talk about uh, Fort Hancock and how Fort Hancock was different than some of the other places as far as, it, this was an Army base. And um, as you know, the Army did not officially desegregate until 1948. And one of the first things I did when I started looking into Fort Hancock and the history of segregation there was I, um, you know, kind of delved deep into just the whole general knowledge of desegregation and what it took to desegregate the armed services. And I ended up meeting a young lady, and it was really a chance meeting, and she began to tell me this story. I was working at the History House at um, Sandy Hook, and she came in and she was telling me she was doing some research and how she had grew up in one of the houses that along Officers Row back in the, she was an elderly woman, so this would have been the 40s. And she told me how her father was a scientist that was working on this top secret project at, at Fort Hancock, and I'm thinking, I've never heard that before. So we talked, we spent a lot of time that day talking, and the, the thing that she told me that really stuck in my mind was she mentioned the fact that her father, as manager of this project, had brought in these engineers and these scientists from all over the country, and they were black, and they were women, and this was 1940, which is totally unheard of. And initially I thought, okay, nice lady, hmm, how true could that be? Well, I started to do some digging, and the first thing I came across was I came across some photographs that were really unusual. And in fact, um, once I get into the PowerPoint, you'll get a chance to see some of the photographs that I found. And uh, dating the photographs was kind of an issue because some of the uh, things, that, photos and things that are in our archives don't necessarily have the dates on them. So I started looking into that, 
And lo and behold, the more I dug, the more I learned. And I really came to find out that the young lady that I met, her story was absolutely spot on. Because uh, right at the start, or even before World War II started, um, Fort Hancock, Fort Monmouth were closely tied together. Fort Monmouth was where they did a lot of the development of weaponry and so forth. But of course, developing weapons, you know you need a place to test them. So, hence, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I learned about this. And you can see, um, I call this from Fort Monmouth to Fort Han Hancock to Camp Evans, the dawn of America's space race early radar detection device. Uh, you can see the picture here. This is actually a picture of an early radar system, and this was actually taken at Fort Mama. You can, okay. uh, the black scientists and engineers that would become the Black Brain Center of America. Now, I cannot date this photograph but I know this photograph was between 1939 and before 1945. So being that the Army <laughs> desegregated in 1948, to see a picture like this where you see males and females, black and white, working together. Okay, can you change it for me? Well, the story goes that um, initially, at the beginning of World War II, that um, the idea was we didn't really want to get involved in that war. Most Americans at the beginning of World War II, they were opposed to us getting involved in another world war. The powers that be seemed intent on trying to keep America neutral. Now we, we're listening, sounding kind of familiar, isn't it? Now, after Hitler invaded Poland, both France and England declared war on Germany on September the 3rd, 1938, and officially World War II began. Now, Blitzkrieg. This was, um, it was, that means lightning war. And this is what Germany used. Um, and they were very successful using this particular thing. What they did was they would send in um, tanks, motorized infantry and artillery, and they would also use their planes with air bombing, and this would enable them to be able to go really deep into their enemy's territory. Now, our military commanders at that time were very concerned. We did not want, and that's the thing a lot of people don't understand, who wants to get involved in a war that you can't win? And that was kind of the whole thing here. We did not want to get involved in a war unless we knew we had a chance of winning it. They were really concerned about early warning detection systems as we begin to gear up for war. The military brass needed a way to identify those bombs and things that were being thrown our way if it was a friend or a foe. And how could we do that quickly? Now, our early radar development uh, started, and actually, I learned this. I didn't know radar is really not a word. It's an acronym, and it stands for Radar Detection and Ranging. Now, this was coined by the U.S. Army during the lead-up to World War II, and the first radar detection devices used sound to track incoming objects. Sound, however, was not a real accurate way because air, aircraft speeds at that time, you remember Germany was doing all this technology with the different types of planes and stuff, and as the aircraft speeds increased, sound was not a good way to detect. And you can see, this is actually a picture of an early radar detection system that was actually, that's taken at Sandy Hook as well. Now, Fort Mount Mama Signal Corps chose Fort Hancock at Sandy Hook to be its testing site. All research and testing of thermal infrared detection devices happened at Fort Hancock until 1935, when the focus of research would shift again, and this time the focus became pulse radio. As you can see, 
There's a little map there to kind of give you an indication of where Fort Monmouth is and its uh, proximity to Sandy Hook. Okay. Um, by 1937, radar technology had progressed to the use of a combination of both thermal and radar detection devices. A demonstration of its effectiveness was conducted for the top brass of the Army and members of Congress at Fort Hancock at Sandy Hook. Now, the success of this demonstration yielded additional funding for the continued development from the War Department. All testing and development after this test were actually transferred to Fort Hancock at Sandy Hook. Now, the Secretary of War felt that Sandy Hook was the perfect location because it was secure and isolated. But the same reasons they chose Sandy Hook would become a problem later on. These, this, again, is one of the very, very first radar models, the SCR-268. This picture is from 1941, and you can see this picture as well. Although it says Fort Monmouth, you remember all the testing was done at Sandy Hook. So all of that radar equipment was actually taken to Sandy Hook, and that's where they actually tested it. This picture, Sandy Hook again. And that's 1941. Now, South Beach. Now, the exact location that they chose for the testing was called South Beach at the time. Today, if you guys are familiar with Sandy Hook, it's Fishing Beach. Um, several wooden structures were built to house the laboratories with more to come as testing and development continued. That's actually taken at Sandy Hook as well. Uh, this picture you can see is from uh, October 29, 1941, and these are actually pictures of those wooden structures that were set up at Fishing Beach. Now, Germany conducts massive bombing raids all over Europe. The U.S. military leadership was worried about Germany's ability to bomb, seemingly at will, targets all across Europe. Additional and accurate warning systems were necessary for America's successful entrance into the war. Again, we did not want to get in a war and we could not win. That was very important. So what they did was they knew radar was going to be the key in this particular war. So what they did was they knew the, the Signal Corps couldn't handle this. So what they decided to do was they brought in some outside contractors. And those two of those outside contractors, the two biggest ones, were Westinghouse and Western Electric. They sourced out to help with the research and development. Now, both of the contractors began to hire civilian They could not get what they needed from the Army Corps. So what they did was they put out a call saying, we need draftsmen, we need engineers, this is important. Unique opportunities abound. Now, because the need was dire for qualified scientists, engineers, draftsmen, this provided opportunities for both African Americans and women. Now these were groundbreaking times because during this time, most African Americans were relegated to menial jobs. You could be a janitor, you could be a maid. You, if you were a little bit more educated, you might could become a teacher to teach black children. But if you had a higher degree, it didn't matter. You were gonna be a maid, a janitor, a teacher. That was it. Now, it was unusual for women and blacks to be hired in, and to work in such highly skilled professions. You can see here, these are actually some pictures from Fort Mama. You can see here, the gentleman here working. You can see the women, it looks like they're in class. These women, they were also working on all kinds of weather. These women were working on weather balloons. Um, groundbreaking projects were undertaken. Now, many of the men that were um, in charge of these projects, they didn't care. They were interested in hiring the best people. They didn't care if you were male, female, black. They didn't care. Most other research facilities were close to blacks at the time. Fort Monmouth and Fort Hancock offered these populations jobs and advancement opportunities they could find nowhere else at that time. These are two, I'm sorry, those were two of the gentlemen that were project managers there. 
Uh, this gentleman, uh, Walter McAfee, uh, what, he's just an awesome person. Uh, now, Dr. McAfee, he had been turned down by several government agencies because of his race. He applied to Fort Mammoth, and he expected, I think they, he said he had tried for like 46 different jobs, and as soon as he had to check that, that African-American box or that black box, suddenly um, he knew he was not going to get the job. Well, he decided to apply to Fort Mama, and he expected the same thing to happen there. They did not ask him for a photograph, and he kind of crossed his fingers and said, maybe we'll see. Well, he was picked for the position, and he even came here, came to Fort Monmouth, and he expected once he arrived on the base to be turned. He really didn't expect for this to work out. He said he was armed with his copy of the Green Book. Now, some of you may be familiar with the Green Book. Uh, the, there was a very popular movie that came out a couple years ago. Um, a very real situation. In fact, throughout the research that I did, with a lot of these gentlemen that came to work on this, these projects, this was a very serious concern um, that just traveling to get here could be extremely dangerous. So, you know, you, you, you brought your, your green book with you because that lets you know where it was safe to stop, where it was safe to eat, you know, what towns to make sure you made a white bird around because they were going to be a problem. So he came along with his green book and he drove from Ohio to New Jersey. Now when he arrived, he was shocked when he walked in Fort Mama because he was not the only African American there and there were women working there as well. So he kind of knew then he had found his, his spot. Again, um, says regrettably, the support that the African-American men and women received on base did not transfer to the contact with the outside community. These men and women often had trouble finding places to eat, places to live, and also finding transportation. Uh, most of the women and men reported that the pay and the chance to work in technical fields outweighed the indignities of outside race. So imagine your choice is making a decent way and where I may be putting my life in jeopardy or danger, but at least, you know, I'm doing what I went to school for, what I'm trying to do. Now, the birth of radar astronomy. Now, Dr. McAfee was pleasantly surprised at the opportunities for advancement at Camp Evans, Fort Hancock. He found that his new bosses, not only were they fair, but they would take up the cost for his advancement. In his own words, he stated that by the year 1948 and the official desegregation of the armed services, I never had any trouble on any army base. My rating was high enough that they didn't bother me, and I usually got the VIP quarters. He would go on to produce the mathematical calculations that would enable us to bounce radio signals off the moon. His work would birth the scientific field of radio astronomy. In fact, the, uh, people don't realize, they have been trying to do this for a long, long time. And it was not successful, not successful. Dr. McAfee came in and said, hey guys, has anybody checked the math mathematical calculations? They were like, ah, yeah, we don't, that's not, a, that's not an issue. Well, that was the issue. And he solved it. Um, I, I love this when I found this poster. This was a poster from August 12, 1945. Now remember, the Army desegregated in 1948. This was a poster that was posted in Fort Monmouth, um, all over Fort Monmouth and Camp Evans. And it was a reminder to all the personnel of the Signal Corps about their commitment to tolerance. And it says, uh, we know that on the battlefield, a bullet is no respecter of color or creed that individual differences invariably dissolve in the face of common danger. Basically, what this is telling the, the, the soldiers there is, we will not tolerate you disrespecting the women here, the African-American people that are here working. 
And um, you can see for them to post this just is amazing to me. That, and that, to me, this let me know this was real. This was absolutely real. And that's from the colonel that's in charge at um, Fort Mama. Uh, opportunities for advancement. Now, Harold Tate, he worked as a civil electronic technician at the fort in 1942. He recalled that he was paid $2,600 a year. Back then, that was quite a bit of money. He was uh, tapped to train as a radar officer, and they sent him to school with 200 other men and women. He recounted how he and other people of color used their positions to start programs to train other people of color for technical careers. Dr. McAfee would help to teach some of those classes. In fact, recently, um, I met the son of the son of one of one of these gentlemen. His father came here to work as an engineer, and he in turn went to school and he became an engineer and worked there as well. So this was something very real that that was happening and that was in, it was incredible. In fact, the army was so insistent on helping them. Uh, when these gentlemen, some of the gentlemen decided they wanted to move off of the base, they found uh, a, an apartment complex. Is it in Long Branch? Yeah. In Long Branch that they basically said, we want our African American soldiers to be able to come here and live. And the army made some kind of deal with them that, um, in fact, the gentleman that I talked to brought me pictures and showed me pictures of the kids playing and because these guys had families and children and um, how the community, the army put them in like a little bubble to protect them there. They were very serious about that. It was incredible to hear. Um, Fort Mama Major General denounces segregation. Um, Major General George Van Dusen told every company commander that there would be no segregation of African American personnel on his post. Colonel Albert Johnson, the first black colonel in the U.S. Signal Corps, remembers, I admired Fort Mama very much. This was one of the few posts I remember being assigned to where everyone was considered as good as everyone else. Everyone was working in harmony, trying to get the best things accomplished. I guess in times like this, this is so wonderful to hear something like this. Uh, these two, just to let you know, it just wasn't men that were um, promoted. These are two African American women. Um, Miss Goodwin, she was hired in 1942 as a technician, and she went on to become a senior engineer. In fact, she told the story about she had to take a test to be an engineer. They weren't really too keen on the girls. They're thinking, eh, you really want to take this test? She had the highest score out of everybody that did. <laughs> so uh, Mary Tate rose from a lab technician to become a computer specialist. Um, there were groundbreaking discoveries that were made. Again, these are two of the early radar systems that were produced out of Fort Mama. Um, Camp Evans, um, black professionals at Fort Monmouth and Fort Hancock were awarded more than 88 new patents for their work. Many of these devices and equipment are still in use by the military today. Some forged new frontiers in science leading to the development of satellites, space communication that's needed for manned space travel, GPS, drones, and the ability to map other planets. Why did they end up moving from uh, Sandy Hook? And again, some of the reasons that they selected Sandy Hook became some of the reasons that they ended up moving it. Um, they moved to Camp Evans. They needed more space, for one. Uh, the second thing was they were concerned because during this time, they were really worried about um, German U-boats off Sandy, Sandy Hook Bay. In fact, there's some claims that there were German U-boats lurking around. In fact, um, I learned this too, the Hindenburg disaster. Did you know it flew right over Sandy Hill? Mm -hmm. And they think there were spies on board there because they knew those radar systems were being worked on. Mm -hmm. 
worked on over there. So some people were not upset that the Henry Club. Yep. Um, they feared the weather was affecting the test equipment and the results. And I, we know that from just being at the beach, the salt water, the wind, it can have a tremendous effect on wood, on, on anything like that. And also their concern, they said Sandy Hook is barely above sea level, and it had been proven that radar worked best at higher elevations. So one thing they did, even before they moved out to Camp Evans, is they began to use twin lights because it's one of the highest points in New Jersey. Um, a little bit of a history of Camp Evans. Um, the land that we become, Camp Evans, it was originally purchased by McConey, the Wireless Telegraph Company of America in 1912. It would become home to the company's receiving equipment for commercial transatlantic radio operations. Nobel Peace Prize winner, Italian inventor, he purchased the land in 1912, and he, he built an impressive hotel to house his employees in 1914. It still stands to this day. Um, this is just some pictures to show you um, him and some of the uh, technologies that he became famous for. And actually, this is a picture of the hotel today. Uh, World War I, 1917 to 1920, America's entry into World War I saw the McConey Station being used as a receiving station for transatlantic communication by the Navy. At the World War's end, a newly formed company, RCA, purchased the property and a former employee of McConey would become its first president. Now this blew me away. Um, after this happened, <laughs> In the 1920s, well, you know, there was a serious resurgence of the Klan in the 1920s. Um, what's the film? Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. Uh, Black Klansman? No, no. I'm talking about the old one in the 20s. Oh, um. It'll come to me in a minute. Yeah. Well, there was a huge resurgence um, in the Klan in that time. And believe it or not, the property that would one day house the Black Brain Center of America was owned by the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, the New Jersey Klan sought to make the 600 acres that became Camp Evans um, into a community of whites only. Um, birth of a nation. Birth of a nation. Hello. Thank you. That's what I was thinking of. Well, you know, that had, had a lot to do with the resurgence. This is actually a Klan rally from the 1920s, right here in Long Branch. Mm -hmm. Well, the good news is that didn't last long, okay? Um, in turn, the land in 1936 was again sold. Um, I think the Klan here went bankrupt. Um, a Protestant minor, minister bought it, and he was trying to start a Christian college. Um, they never got accredited, and that college in turn moved to Delaware where it was easy to get accreditation, and again, the land was just there. Um, and that's when the Army purchased the land. Um, in the fall of 1941, the Signal Corps brought the property. The plan was to close the temp temporary laboratories at Fort Hancock and to expand to the more secure location that was Camp Evans. It was initially named the Signal Corps Radar Laboratory. They would change the name during World War II because, remember, it was supposed to be a secret. You can't have a big sign saying this is where our radar stuff is. And, and so they took the sign down. Um, spying was always a big concern. And I can tell you it should have been a big concern then. A lot of people don't realize this, but the two people, uh, the Rosen, were at Camp Evans. Mm. <laughs> well, not the wife. She didn't work for the Army, but her husband did. The Rosenbergs? Yes! He worked at Camp Evans. A lot of people don't realize that. Yep. Uh, again, these are some early pictures that I found. Again, um, these are from Fort Hancock. You can see here, 
uh, some of the early radar detection devices. And again, you can see, look at the soldiers. They're soldiers of color. Again, more pictures. And I just love the fact that the women were given opportunities. This is, I mean, incredible. In 1940, I could become a woman and I could become an engineer? Incredible. Yeah, this is um, just a sign from back then. Some little known facts about Fort Mama, Fort Hancock, and Camp Adams. I, I, when I heard this story, I loved it. That very first radar that you saw in the presentation, which was the SCR-268, it was developed at Fort Mama, and it was tested at Fort Hancock. Those, there were, I think there were three in place at Pearl Harbor. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, that radar system worked. It told us at least 30 to 40 minutes before that attack happened. In fact, and the story goes, some of you may have heard it, there was a, a young soldier on duty. He was only like 21 years old. He saw what came across the radar. He told his superiors. They looked at it and said, eh, that's new equipment. It's probably just a glitch. And they ignored it. The radar system worked. If they had listened, it probably would have went a lot differently, but they didn't. They didn't trust their own equipment, which was is incredible here. Um, the detonators that were used in the atomic bombs that we dropped on Japan, Nagasaki, and Hiroshima were developed at Camp Evans. Uh, oops. That's okay. Um, the original owner of the property that will become Camp Evans, he was an Italian immigrant, and he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his radio radio the same year that the Wright brothers were nominated for the airplane, and he beat them. And you know why the Wright brothers lost? That's too dangerous. Are you kidding me? People are going to die. <laughs> it's just funny to hear those things now. The only two people to ever be accused, tried, convicted, and executed for spying were the Rosenbergs. Julius Rosenberg worked at Camp Evans. Um, infamous Senator Joseph McCarthy. He came to Camp Evans, he visited, and he started pointing fingers and accusing people of being spies. Well, he might have had a little point because there was a spy there, but that was the end of McCarthy. When he came to Camp Evans and began to accuse people, that was his, that was his downfall. That was the end. They were like, you've gone too far now. Um, Camp Evans today, it's a science and history museum. It has exhibits that are dedicated to helping preserve, educate, and honor scientific innovation. And you can see here now, um, they call uh, Camp Evans Info Age. Um, uh, Ranger Tyrone and I, we've been there many times. You've been there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's awesome, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really is. It's a great place. Um, there's, they have a lot of um, veterans that work there that know this stuff back and forth. And lot, much of what I learned, how many times we go there? Five, six times? I just would go there and spend the whole day and just, it, it's a wonderful place to learn about the history. And it's right here in New Jersey. It's so amazing. Um, I just included this because it's a great place to take kids. Um, there's not many museums where you can take kids where you can say, go for it, touch everything in here. And that is their attitude there. They want the kids to experience, to touch, to show them. Again, they have veterans that work throughout the museum. Um, they will help the kids. Again, I learned so much. One, I, one story that I can tell you, um, we met a gentleman, in fact, I, his picture is toward the end, and he was just telling us um, different, all the different technologies that have been developed at Camp Evans, and probably one of the most recent ones, well, two of them. Do you remember the little hot box he showed us? 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, when the president or any uh, major uh, person in government, there's this little hot box that they put on the plane. Mm -hmm. And so that if someone is trying to shoot down the plane, it, it, it avoids that. It stops that from happening. Because you can't tell, is it this the one? Is he on this one? Is he on this one? Because, and it's a little device that was developed at Camp Atlas. The other thing that really blew my mind was, um, he asked us, he's like, when's the last time you heard about an IED? It's like, wow, it's been years, right? Because remember for a time, it was IEDs and the soldiers were being wounded and Camp Atlas solved the IED problem. And he explained the whole thing to me. <laughs> you know, amazing. And something, un it's real, a real heat simple. Seeking. Heat seeking. Uh, uh, heat seeking heat something? Heat yes, heat. yes. But even to this day, they are still developing technologies that are just absolutely amazing. Again, these are some of the gentlemen, again, that I we had the great opportunity to to talk to when um, these guys, like I say, it's like a living World War II memorial. These guys know so much, they've seen so much, they're wonderful, they take the time out, um, they love to teach kids. It's a great place to go and to learn. And it's, again, it's right here, right here in our community. All right. That's basically it, if no one has any questions or anything they'd like to ask. Is Camp Evans part of the park system? No, they just recently got national historic uh, recognition. They, they so want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. They really do, because they know uh, if they became a part of the park service or just that they would get the funding they need to, to save some of these buildings and things. And like the hotel, it's in mm -hmm. disrepair. I mean, it's to be built when it was built, it's doing pretty good, but they've got all kinds of um, vehicles from World War II. Some places that it's the only one that there is. They showed us some, um, some uh, things that they had captured from the Germans. They said, this is the only one we know exists in the world. And they're right there at Camp Evans. And if we don't, you know, if it's not preserved, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so. All right. So I will conclude. With this. Okay. Thank you. Right, thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tracy Hall. Um, that was fabulous, very informative. And um, this, so again, this is going to be recorded, so you can find this presentation on our YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.